Hey everyone. Good to see you. Me too. So my name is Chris Lewis. Um, I was a student of Larry's um, 11 years ago as a as a freshman here at UMass. Um, like a lot of UMass Boston students, I kind of just wandered wandered in um, both to Larry's class and and into college in general. Um, I didn't didn't always see myself going to college. Uh, had I had gone to high school uh, once in a while, just across uh, Carson Beach from here at Southie. Um, tried to make it through the ninth grade a couple times, and that didn't work out for me. So it was really by chance that I ended up uh, as a student here in um, in the fall of 2006. Um, kind of just signed up for classes on a whim. Um, and then in the spring semester of 2007, I, I was lucky enough to um, sign up for Larry's Philosophy 318 class, Race and Racism, which I'm back this year to, to teach now myself. Um, in, the, in the meantime, I have gone on from, from graduating at UMass in, in 2008 to uh, a JD and PhD from Stanford. Um, my thank you, thank you. Um, my my day job is not here. I'm I'm on the faculty at Harvard in a, in a unit called the Society of Fellows, um, which I just started in September. Um, but it's been a real joy to come back to UMass Boston and to get to teach this class, which had such an impact on me. Um, and taking this class was just maybe the luckiest thing that has ever happened to me in my life. So it's been a real joy to come back. And, um, and get to see this, this institution um, from a different angle. I think UMass Boston is really special. I don't wanna foreshadow too much of what Larry is going to talk about, but um, it was a very special opportunity for me to be able to attend a public urban research university like this, a real, a real public university like this. Um, if it wasn't for UMass, I don't think I would've gone on to college at all, let alone become uh, a scholar or somebody with a PhD or a JD. Um, so in the class, uh, we've been reading some, uh, some of Larry's book, 2002 book. Um, uh, um, and we've also, over the last week, been studying one of his articles from 2004 called um, Stereotypes and Stereotyping, um, a Moral Analysis. Um, and this, uh, this article is a really good example, I think, of one of Larry's very uh, distinctive and special skills as a, as a researcher and scholar um, that others have touched on in, in passing but haven't, haven't focused on so much today. And that is Larry's ability to draw insights from many different disciplines um, which may be talking uh, about the same topic but not talking uh, together about the same topic and, um, and not incorporating each other's insights. Um, so, so in this particular paper, he draws on insights from cultural studies, uh, media and film studies, and uh, experimental social psychology, and he brings them together using many of the tools of, um, of humanistic style moral psychology, moral philosophy, um, to, talk, to, to give a, a, a very subtle account of what stereotypes are, how they work, and how that bears on questions about um, what might be wrong with them, um, why, why they might be bad. Um, and so this is something that uh, we've been thinking about in the class this week. And um, right now is an opportunity for, this, for the students um, to, to have a conversation with Larry and, and ask him some questions about, about the paper or the book or, or anything else related to, um, to race philosophy, and, uh, and, and the topics that we've been talking about today. Great. Thank you. I, I just want to say how excited I am that Chris is teaching this course that I taught for, for 20 years. I'm very proud of him as well. But it's also great that he wants to come back and teach you all. And 
you know, as I said earlier, I just love teaching UMass Boston students for the 45 years that I did it. And I'm really happy to have this interaction with you all. I want to say that if you have a question but you're not sure you've got it formulated precisely exactly right, don't worry about that. Just mm -hmm. put it out there. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. So in your moral analysis um, of stereotypes and stereotyping, uh -huh. you stated that it's possible for um, stereotypes to function at sub-belief levels. Uh -huh. um, do you fear that creating the distinction between um, a sub-belief and an actual belief could uh -huh. inadvertently have like the effects on, negative effects on like identifying stereotype as a bad thing? Uh -huh. So tell me your name. Daphne. Daphne. So just say one more thing about why you think it might go, it, go, off, go in that bad direction. Um, just from reading it, it, there was really no, the line was so blurred yeah. between the sub-belief and an yeah. actual belief that it was kind of hard for me personally to, uh. to draw the distinction between the two. I felt like it still was stereotyping and it still does have a negative impact. So there's yeah. no, by making that difference, it almost like plays a passive role in the issues of stereotyping. That's how I write I it. I see. So. Okay, great, great, okay. Um, so it, it, it seems to me, you know, I want to argue in that paper, as you know, that stereotyping is basically always a bad thing. And there's a kind of newer tradition of thinking about stereotypes as a kind of inevitable cognitive simplification. I don't like that view. So I'm on your side when it comes to wanting to you know, see stereotyping as a bad thing. But it just seems to me that um, there are a lot of people who might use a stereotype. And if you said to them, oh, do you really think you know, all black people are blah, blah, blah? They'd say, oh, of course I don't know that. Right. I, of course I don't believe that. So I just think that holding a stereotype doesn't always operate at the same level as sort of a conscious belief. And that we need to recognize that people are invested in those stereotypes, even if they don't recognize that yeah. they are. And to be able to sort of call them out and to you know, figure out ways to help people to recognize that they are channeling a stereotype that they have some cognitive investment in. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I wanted to ag admit that there's this sub-belief form. I agree with you. I don't have any clear way of dra <laughs> drawing that line. Yeah. But I just want to say that the sub-belief forms are bad. Mm -hmm. So there's a badness that's all the way th through that whole spectrum. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hi. Um, What's are your there, name? To start with your oh, name. Oh, Daniel. Daniel. Uh -huh. Are there any like strong contenders to your philosophy working today? And if so, like how often do they make do their arguments make you reevaluate and reconsider your theories on a fundamental level? Does that so make Daniel, sense? you're asking me about more generally, not just about stereotypes, but as a more general oh, thing. Oh yeah, can I ask? This? Like if you're if you're kind of out there you know, if your views are out there and then people are challenging them. Yeah. Yes, it does make me, you know, often makes me reevaluate. I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes you might rethink something and end up thinking, no, 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 I was really right. But you've still learned something more because you've dealt with the challenge to you. I think it's really helpful for any scholar to be, um, to be challenged, you know, it's, it's, it, it really helps you think more deeply for somebody to challenge you. Often when people challenge you, you haven't thought of that problem before. Sometimes you have, but sometimes you haven't. And so, yes, I, th I think it's a good thing and I sometimes do it. And as I say, I sometimes end up at the same place I started, but I've got a deeper appreciation of it. Thank you. Great. Um, my name is Marla. Marla. Um, so my biggest question would be, what's the biggest difference between believing in a stereotype and believe, like, in having a racist belief? What is the difference at the end? Uh huh. Good. Good. Um, I mean, a racist belief, in a way, 
I mean, do you have an example of what you would call a racist belief that, that might help me? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so my little cousin turned to me and she said, is it racist to say that all black people wear saggy, all, all black boys wear saggy pants in my school? Uh -huh. And I said, or, and she said, or is it a stereotype? And what is a stereotype? And I didn't know how to answer, so that's why. Is that what, who, who said that to you? My little cousin. Well, she's, she's that's very, to, you know, interesting that she would formulate it that way. I mean, did she, did she was she saying, is, if it's a stereotype, then it's not a bad thing? I think no. she had just learned the word stereotype. I see. I, so I thought, like, the eight-year-olds, do they all know what a stereotype is? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so a belief, so somebody articulates a belief, all the, was it that all black kids wear <coughs> saggy, saggy pants? pants. Yes. So, I mean, that's a kind of, if it's formulated as a belief, you're attributing to a racial group, you know, a certain style. And the way you formulated it was all black kids, say under yeah, yeah. 18 or whatever, wear baggy pants. Obviously that's false, right? right? Yeah. So clearly if you formulate it with the, uh, What's the word for all? You know, a universal something or other quantifier. thing. Universal quantifier. <laughs> I'm sorry, my t philosophical terminology has always been a little weak. Um, so clearly, it is a false belief. But it's also a stereotype. That is, there's a stereotype of black kids as having baggy pants. And a, a stereotype isn't always the same as a universal generalization. Sometimes it's vaguer. That's part of what I was arguing in the article. It's like you associate a group with a certain characteristic. And if somebody says to you, do you really think all of that group has that characteristic? M you know, most people say no. But they might still be, as it were, channeling or having that stereotype operating in their kind of mental, mental universe. So I think the case you gave, when you stated it as a universal generalization, it's, I don't know if I, I guess it's, I'm not sure if I want to call it a racist belief, but it's a bad belief that has a racial element to it. So let's, let's say, um, but it also is probably coming from a stereotype as well. I don't, I don't want to say that stereotypers never admit that they're, or, or would, would always say, no, I don't believe that all of that group has that characteristic. I think sometimes they would say that they did. And one of the articles, I can't remember which one, that I quote in the article, was a, uh, there's a kind of older tradition of thinking about stereotyping in which it always involved this universal feature. That is that every, you thought that every member of this group had that question. All Jews are greedy, every single one of them. And so, and there's some experiments that were done using that way of formulating stereotypes. But in the, in the more contemporary thing where people are somewhat more self-aware, somewhat more self-aware, not enough, but somewhat more self-aware, they will usually deny the universal one, but they might still have this vaguer, less than universal one operating. Yes. Little boys in your school wear saggy So, okay. So I, um, I've given some thought, which is not in that article at all, about how you would teach about stereotypes. And I sort of devised a, a kind of a lesson plan that some teachers use, but I've never seen teachers actually use it. But it does involve several steps, but, but that's one of the early steps, is to sort of formulate the statement as a universal statement and put it to the person. Yeah. Do you really think? And then sort of see what they say and kind of work with it. Like they might say, okay, not all of them do, but most of them do. And then do you think, you know, she's right. If, you know, if you're observing kids in your school, that's different from saying something about that group as a totality in the whole society or whatever, right? So if it's something that's really a matter of their own personal experience, you know, you can ask them, well, you know, what makes you think that? And sort of probe their evidence basis for, for saying what they're saying. And then 
try to take it a step further, you know, if they're not seeing what's wrong with it. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Great, great question. So my name is Reina, and I guess my Reina. question comes out of curiosity. Um, so in your book, I'm Not Racist, but The Moral Quandary of Race, you <coughs> talked about, like, you have this specific phrase that says, like, not all racial acts are, like, racist acts. Uh -huh. So I just wondering, like, in, like, the contemporary view of, like, racist right now, right, and everything that's going on in the political landscape with, um, yeah, yeah. you know, like, race issues, what would you consider a race act? And, like, also taking into account like that individual experience of people, how to go about like when you yeah, tell yeah. someone, I'm not being racist. I'm right. Discrediting their experience, experiences um, with how they feel. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. That's a really important question. Um, <clears throat> people have the experiences that they have. And, but they formulate their experiences in a set of concepts that are kind of out there available to everybody. And s sometimes you might formulate your experience in a way that's authentic to your actual experience, but you might have not characterized it in a way that is exactly, um, you know, the, 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 the use of that word would, would warrant. The trouble with racism is that it's a word that's so it's used in so many millions of different ways that it's kind of hard to say this one is right and this one is, is wrong. And so, you know, when I'm in an exchange with someone and they say this thing is racist, I usually try to, try to get to the next step and say, could you say that in another, in another way? So, you know, I mean, maybe, if, could you give me an example of a, of a kind of experiential thing? Because it's a good, it's a very good issue. So I work with a nonprofit. Um, uh, we work with immigrant youth and documented youth from different uh -huh. statuses. So their experiences have been, uh, yeah, their individual experience have been different, but they've been uh -huh. horrible. It, they institutionalized, they've been oppressed. Um, so when I have the conversation with them, and someone tells me someone is being racist to our speech. Uh -huh. um, oh, sorry. So, so someone's being racist towards yeah. me. How do I go about and telling that person's not being racist with you? You uh, know, like without me actually saying your experience doesn't count. Right. But right. They, at the end of the day, they're leaving their, this experience and like they go home and they face it in, their, in schools, in the streets and everywhere. So I'm just wondering how that conversation will look. So would you ask them like, what is the experience that happened to them, which they called racist? Yeah. Um, and For so example, what would be an example? Uh, I, I wouldn't talk about their experience because like, you know, like we have this policy of not talking on this uh. here, but I can talk about, I'm undocumented, for example, and then the way people have treated me outside in terms of like calling, like literally profiling me, have cops stop me because I'm brown and they assume that I'm undocumented immediately uh. and ask me for papers. So that to me is institutionalized racism. I agree. So how would I go and say to people like, you know, it's based on your individual experience that something is racist or be racist or not because you said like racism is so widely spread and race that the word racist use like racism is used in like really like vague rag um yeah but it's like it's also like how do you not discredit your ex the experience of people that are actually living through in the system that is like affecting them directly yes absolutely so you to me, you've given a good example of an experience that, that does illustrate uh, institutional racism and racist treatment by a plausible definition of, of racism. But as you probably know, some people think that if you accuse someone of being racist, you're racist. That the person who says someone else is racist, that makes them racist. So that's like another use of the word racism that's kind of like come, it's, you know, you might say, well, you, you don't understand racism if you think that just because I said you're racist, that makes me racist. It's like two different issues. But it is true that the word racism is often used in a way that if you accuse someone else of being racist, you're racist. And another one that's different but can overlap with that one is just if you bring race up. So some people call that playing the race card. Mm -hmm. If you bring race up and say, well, maybe there's like some racial aspect to the way you're dealing with this immigrant mm -hmm. kid or this immigrant population. Mm -hmm. Somebody will say, oh my God, you're playing the race card. And then some people think that means you're racist. Mm -hmm. 
So, I, I, my, so my one worry is just that the, that the word racist is used in so many different ways that it can lose some of its force. But I agree with you, though, that for the population you're talking about and the young people that you're dealing with, it's capturing something real about their experience and it's, it, it's conceptualizing it in a very appropriate kind of way. But, you know, I'm sorry, just to like, <laughs> but I do think that if someone just says, um, somebody treated me in a racist way, I would say, could you describe to me what actually happened to you? Because of the sort of vagueness around the word racism, I would want to hear what's the experience. That, so what do you think about I, that? Well, I don't want to take too much. No, that's cause fine. Because I feel like sometimes, I think we were talking about this, how when you talk about race, it makes people uncomfortable. But like you have to be uncomfortable yes. when you talk about this type of issues. Otherwise, how are you supposed to learn from each other and teach people what's wrong and right? So I agree. I just think like, yes, yeah, sometimes like playing the race card might be bad, but sometimes you need to have those type of conversations especially now that during the times we're living, uh, when people are like so dismissive towards your experience that they're like, I get yeah. But I think it's really important to have conversations, whether you feel comfortable or not, I think it's good for you to have those conversations. I agree. I completely agree. Of course, that's the whole point of having a course where you, that's what you're doing in the whole course is you're, you know, you're kind of having those conversations and hopefully you can sometimes take those conversations and help you to engage with maybe somebody in your social circle who, you know, is one of these people who, if you bring race up, they just like hit the roof or, you know, go crazy or something like that. Because unless people are willing to really talk about the race and unless, you know, some of these kind of people that you're talking about can hear what the kids you're working with are experiencing, they're not gonna get what's going on. So I, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> oh, okay. um, hi. Hi, your name is? I'm Sherry. Um, Sherry. So you kind of mentioned it briefly, but um, talking about universalist, like, um, uh -huh. universalist like thought process. So uh -huh. would you say that there, even though that's an older belief, that there is a link between stereotypical thought and like an essentialist uh -huh. like thought process? Great. Great. Yes. Yes. I do. I do think. So your question is that I was saying that there was this kind of earlier tradition about stereotyping where the, the stereotype was framed as all X's are Y. And you're saying, even if you give that up, isn't there still some essentialism going on? Even if you drop the pure universalism. Is that what you're saying? So. Well, maybe I could ask you, say just a little bit more what you mean by essentialism. Just uh, if, could you? <laughs> yeah, just, um, like essentialism in the sense that, because when you talk about stereotypes in the piece, you say that they're, um, what's it called? An overgeneralization that's uh -huh. false and yeah. that even if proof is given, people will still like hold on to that belief. Uh -huh. So I think that there is some sort of like essentialist uh -huh. believing that it's inherent in the group that someone is stereotyping in that yeah. person's thought process. If when they are presented with evidence, they do not give up that thought, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. I see, I see. Okay. so. So, right, so what I was saying in the, in the piece is that sometimes when people are presented with counter evidence against their stereotypical generalization, they won't take in that evidence. They won't dislodge their stereotype. They'll hold on to the stereotype and say, oh, that person's an exception, but the group is still, you know, like this way that I originally said, right? Yeah. So, so what, you're, what you're saying is that the quality in people that makes them unable to take in evidence against their belief, right? That's what you're interested in. Is that right? Yeah, I'm. I don't think it's like a part of human nature to think that to way. do that. I was, yeah, I was yeah. just curious, like, if there really is like a separation between stereotyping and uh -huh. that sort of like essentialist thought process. Well, so so the the. the 
So my, you know, I argue in the piece that it's part of stereotypical thinking that you don't take in counter evidence very easily. You have to be hit with a whole lot of it before you really take it in. And that's part of stereotypical thinking. I don't think it's part of human nature, but it is a familiar way of thinking. All of us do it some of the time, right? Um, but stereotypes are bad. So when you do it in the, in the context of stereotypes, you're, you're in a way wronging the group that you're continuing to attribute this, this characteristic to. And so, uh, you know, again, I agree that it's, it isn't part of human nature. I think um, the word essentialist, this is one of these philosophical terms that I'm, I always uh, defer to Sally about stuff like this. Um, <laughs> because I don't know ex exactly understand it. But I think what's right about, about the use of the word essentialist is that you somehow think that group, you know, the kids wearing baggy pants, is somehow inherent in their nature to have that characteristic. And that's part of stereotypical thinking, even if you don't make it a universal generalization. Yeah, I agree. Good. Um, I'm Christina. Um, so in your book, you made it a point to talk about how race was not always, like it's not an inherent thing, like uh, people, like it wasn't always, it didn't always exist, the uh, idea of race. Um, yeah. And then in your stereotypes piece, you talked about how now stereotypes are kind of like a cognitive investment people have, so like they have it without even like thinking about it. Um, so I was wondering if you thought that there was any oh. like, solution to like get rid of cognitive investment or if humans are just doomed <laughs> to, to kind of screwed up about yeah, that yeah, yeah. and so Christine you're you're you link you said two different things and I'm not completely sure how they're connected the first is that I said that the idea of race is not something that human beings always use to understand each other. It came on the scene at a certain historical time. And so in a certain way, it's not a necessary feature of kind of human existence. Yeah. It's just a feature of our existence, but it's not a necessary feature of all human existence. So I wasn't sure how to connect that with the, the part you're saying about people you know, naturally gravitating toward these stereotypical. Just the fact that there was a time when we didn't always look at it. Uh -huh. Like people are ah. different, but now we do, so can we go back to I a see, time great. Like that? Okay, so, so I think that probably stereotyping itself has been around forever because I do think it's not inevitable, but it is a product of some very familiar. Uh, aspects of, of human life and human social life. So I don't think we're going to ever be able to go back to a time before there was stereotyping. I do think we could go, oh, I mean, you can't go back anyway, period, because you just can't do that. But you can envision a time that there was no race. And so it's, that's a conceivable thing. Um, I mean, it's conceivable for people to never stereotype, but I just don't think it could actually be accomplished. On the other hand, though, I just want to add, I don't want it, that to go in a pessimistic direction. I do think that any individual who stereotypes a particular group, they can learn to not stereotype that particular group. And you just take it one by one. You, you know, you help them get rid of this stereotype, you help them get rid of that one, then you go to the next person. So there's, there's always, you can always make progress in the right direction about stereotyping. Thank you. Great. Thomas. Professor, yep. Uh, my name's Tomas, um, and so my question's around. So you mentioned in your book, the that you know currently we have this um, popular understanding of race, right, within the country, and I've been th I've been thinking about that a lot, and I definitely um, believe that's true, right? Like most people that grow up in the United States have a, a very strong understanding of race and can kind of put people into racial categories, uh -huh. and then you throughout your works um, use common racial categories, you know, you reference white and black and Asian and, and Latino. And I just, I do wonder if you, if you think there's any dangers to doing this or if there's any um, particular positives to constantly referring to these um, yeah. racial categories that we can also agree are, are invented. Yeah, great. 
So, Tomas, you were in my multiculturalism class, right? I, but I was not, the race, not the racism yes, class, right? Yes, right, so right. 232, I believe. 232. It was many years ago, but yes, I, rem was. I remember you. Um, um, so that's a, great, that's, that's, that's a great question. And I have actually, I have to admit, I wrote an article that answers your question, in a sense, in, in, two, in, in, two, in 2010. And I think that um, I, I do continue to use racial language because it's very hard to name the system of white supremacy, as, as Charles calls it, and the groups produced by white supremacy without making some reference to racial language in some way, but the way races are understood in, in that way of trying to capture a historical experience is different from the way people, especially back in the 19th century, thought of races. They thought of races as groups that were biologically distinct, had different genetics, uh, they implied different genetic structures, that their whole natures were completely different from each other. That's, and you're right to say, isn't there a worry that if you use this racialized, that's my terminology, this racialized language, which is the same words as the racial language, that some people are going to bring the associations with that very dangerous idea of race into, the, into their understanding of what's going on. Yes, I think that is a danger. I really do. But I think that that danger is outweighed by wanting to dismiss racial language because then you cannot name white supremacy. You can't name racial injustice. You can't name reparative justice. I and mean, there's just all kinds of things you, that are part of the world we live in and you will be depriving yourself of language that you need to, to name that. So I, I think there is a danger, and you have to kind of look to see whether, like a particular time you're using it, the person you're talking to is like going in a, what's called a racialist direction with that, you know, and, and then do your best from there. Thank you. Great. So should we? Yeah, should we should, yeah. Okay. Thank thank you all. That was great. That was really great. It's like I'm back in the classroom again.